Um, our first speaker today is Ariel Essex. She's sat very uh, humbly over here on the side. A lot of you may know Ariel from the film The Living Matrix because she not only talks about the, the therapeutic modality of NLP and about working consciousness and intention constructively for your health and taking power in your own life and learning about what is the real core issue of your pathology or your health problem. But she actually, in the film, shares with us the time in her life when she suffered from a brain tumor that was the basis of her health problem. And Ariel has said that that's not what she's going to talk about today, and also she's not taking questions about that time in her life. She's going to share with us constructively how we work with health problems and what health problems, what illness is trying to tell us. Is that correct? I was incredibly taken with Ariel when I saw the film the first time and when I experienced her in London because I had a, a baby sister who died from a brain tumor about six years ago. So what Ariel was talking about went right in here and I wish I had met Ariel at that time. Welcome so much. You're giving us all a lot of hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, good morning. I see you all looking very different than you were yesterday. How are you feeling? There we are, day three. Are, you, are your brains kind of filling up? <laughs> um, I did say to Jeff that I was not going to talk about my story today, but later on, if we have time for questions, I am happy to answer any question you might have whatsoever. Uh, the reason I'm not telling my story is because, funny enough, I am a bit shy about talking about my personal experience, and I've told it so many times. A lot of you have seen the movie. You know, you can read my story in my book, Compassionate Coaching. And I now have a very extensive version giving you the blow-by-blow -blow account and how I did it in a downloadable book on my website. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, today what I would like to talk about is how people somatize, how they somatize emotions. Now, this is a, a subject very dear to my heart. And before I begin, I, I might need to apologize if I cough a bit because I've had a bad cold. I am the queen of somatizing feelings. And so I needed to understand how it happens that when you have a feeling that you don't feel, you push it down into your body. And then what to do about it rather than just getting sick. And part of my brain tumor story was about how I had somatized things that I hadn't dealt with. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. I like to deal with some nitty gritty questions too, like, you know, you're doing the best job as a healer, you're giving the best treatment, but some people, why don't they get well? What stops them? What blocks them from getting well? Why don't treatments work all the time for everybody? You know, they could, they should, because they work for some people, so why don't they always work? These were the kinds of questions that plagued me I've been working in the health fields for about 25 years. I was a fully trained osteopath and naturopath, but my real love was kinesiology. And then I got so involved with this mind-body aspect of medicine that I wanted to really focus on that. Now, in osteopathy, they govern the whole of their theory um, on the principle that structure governs function. And at first, that made sense to me. If you get the structure of your body right, everything is held in the right place, the circulation works, the nervous system can work, it should be perfect. But it sort of begged a question. If structure governs function, what governs structure? <laughs> and of course, the osteopaths weren't interested in dealing with that question, so I had to go elsewhere to find out. So when it came time for me to do my thesis, I decided to do my thesis on stress, on understanding how stress gets into the structural aspect of the body. And that was a really good beginning point for me. I mean, what's the number one cause 
for people taking time off work. The number one complaint, do you know? It's, it, I know what it is in the UK. I'm pretty sure it's the same in Germany and every other country. Who? Back pain. Back pain. Absolutely, back pain. What are you going to do with back pain with NES? Are people going to come to you with back pain? Yes? Maybe, maybe not expressly, unless you educate them about what's really going on. Now, Peter, the other day, was talking about the homunculus, the fact that the wiring of the brain is very disproportional to the body. 50% of the nerves of the brain go to one area. Do you remember which area? This area. Now, it's the jaw, but it's also the mouth, the taste buds, the tongue, the muscles, the, probably even part of the sense of smell. So this area of your body is intensely active. So when I was doing my thesis, I was really amazed to discover that when you get a really negative emotion and it kicks in that adrenaline response, where does, what's the first reaction in the body? Now, usually you see those stress diagrams and they talk about all the, the hormones and, and the effect on the digestion and stuff. Do you know what the very first thing that happens is under stress? The first thing that happens? This muscle in your cheek goes eek, it tightens. It's called the masseter muscle. And the masseter muscle grits your teeth together. Now, if you think about an animal, a cat or a dog that's about to have a fight, what do they do first when they see the other animal come in the room? Now, try doing that without gritting your teeth. You've got to use that muscle. In fact, stick your fingers in your cheeks and grit your teeth. Feel how strong that muscle is? One of the strongest muscles in the whole body is that muscle. How many people grind their teeth at night? How many people have teeth problems? A lot of that is to do with the stress that's being held in that muscle that never gets released. But that's just the starting point. Now, the reason why this muscle is the first thing that happens is that under stress, there's a danger that you could receive a blow to your head. Now, if you received a blow to your head in the wrong direction, it kills you instantly. Nature knows this. So nature has a protective mechanism. There's 14 plates that make up your skull, and they, they fit together, interdigitated together like that, with enough, enough movement for them to breathe so that your whole head can expand and contract. Now, all of the sutures are like that, except for the one on your ear, which is like a wagon wheel. And it has a movement like this, and it fits to the other skull bones in a sliding joint so that it can move more freely. This is partly for the chewing mechanism and partly just one of the design faults of the body, perhaps. Because if you receive a blow right here, and anybody who's done karate or other martial arts knows that that's the killer blow, right? Right to the temple. It knocks this bone out of place, exposing the brain, and you're dead. So nature knows this. And it says, if you tighten this muscle, this muscle will also tighten and lock that bone down real hard so the whole head becomes a drum. So whenever you're under stress, your head is turned into this impervious drum. Could that explain why you don't think so well under stress? Ever notice your, 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 your brain gets sort of clogged in one direction because you're, it's no longer able to expand and breathe. You're not able to tap into different areas of it. So this whole mechanism is the first part of stress. And then it goes down your neck and your shoulders. How many people have shoulder pain under stress? How many people sit at desks and say, oh, it must be my desk? Well, sometimes it is a desk. More often, it's just the stress you're feeling that's gotten locked in your body that hasn't been released. Now, moving down the body, what I discovered was that it was like a ding, 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 ding. And the next thing that happens, if we go back to the animal, they, they're growling, right? And their shoulders come up. And then you know, all their muscles tighten, and their skin and their hair fluffs out to make them look bigger, right? So if they look bigger, then if they get a swipe, it's not going to hurt 
their body. They just get a bunch of hair. So they, they're tightening up. And then they're going to brace themselves, right? So you brace yourself either you know, to fight and hold your ground, or if you think about how you run a race, it's the same position. One foot in front of the other, right? On your marks, get set, go, right? So the pelvis has to torque in order to allow you to either brace yourself or take that running leap. If the pelvis is torquing, but you're not moving, it stays torqued. Now, the pelvis is a strange bone. It's made of two bits, two bits that move around. And they can move together, and they can move separately. They can rotate. Now, when they tilt together, you get one kind of problem. When they go in opposite directions, you get a much worse kind of problem. But either way, it leaves an uneven base plane for the rest of your spine to sit upon. So think about it. If your base plane is like this, now what does your spine have to do in order to stand up straight? Because you don't see many people walking around like this, do you? Unless they've got a bad disc and they really can't straighten up. Most people, their spine curls around and then curls back, and you get a scoliosis. Now, this is why people have so much bad back. It starts with that stress getting locked in the pelvis. So it all started with the stress. So here I was working as an osteopath, thinking, I'm working all the way down the line, fixing people's backs, but I'm not doing anything about the stress. They come in the next week saying, my back still hurts, or it helped a bit, but now it's back. It was you know, sort of uh, dismaying. And plus, in kinesiology, we had a term for the, the tilted pelvis, the one that went like this, it was called category one, and it was also nicknamed emotional pelvis. I saw so many category one pelvises. It was like boring. Another person would come in, category one. You, know, you could almost identify which other vertebrae would be needing to be fixed because it was always the same pattern, the same pattern, the same pattern. And I got looking at this and I thought, this, this isn't good enough. I, I need to help people better than just fixing their backs. And so I thought, it has to be looking at the other aspects of it. So gradually, I got involved in um, the mind-body more and more and started training in NLP, because I was also concerned about what I said to my clients. You know, if I said the right things to my clients, it might help them. But if I didn't say the right thing, it might hurt them. And I didn't want to leave them in a worse state than they came in. And it's easy to do that. Even the most well-meaning people can say something that sounds OK on the surface, but actually it leaves the person feeling worse than they did before. So as I got more and more involved in looking at the mind-body side, my whole practice changed over to doing NLP, because I was getting better results. People were actually getting out of pain and staying out of pain. I thought, this is, this is fantastic. And when I was diagnosed with my brain tumor, I had to apply all this to myself. And gradually, as I got to the point of writing my book, I realized, what was causing my brain tumor wasn't any different than what causes other problems, both health problems, life problems, relationship problems. In fact, when I was working with my clients, I wasn't even working on health issues. I was working on their life issues. So I came to the conclusion that healing works by the same principles as being able to manifest change in any other aspect of your life. Now, this was great, and I've been working on this principle and having a wonderful time with my clients and getting marvelous change and discovering all kinds of things. But you know, I, I was a weird kind of bunny to start with. And he, when I was a little girl, uh, my father used to take me with him to get his car serviced. In, in America, you had to have your car serviced every year and pass the annual inspection. I don't know if it's the same here in Germany, yeah? Um, but in America, it was the most fun thing to do because we had this long barn. And you drove the car in one end. And out from the sides of the barn would come all these mechanics. 
and they check the windshield wipers, and they check the, 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 whether the car was corroded, and then you'd move on to the next step, and you'd get onto one of those ramps, and that was the fun bit. You'd get elevated up to the ceiling, and then the mechanics would go underneath, and they'd check the brakes and the tires and you know, everything else, and then you went into another bit, and they had brought these plates down, and you had to put your headlights on to see whether your headlights were tracking in the right way. I thought this was great fun as a child. And I had this dream in my head. Even then, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had a machine like this for people? <laughs> and you know, I think we're getting close with NES. I think we're getting very close, maybe better than that, because that was still looking at the outside bit, the physicality of the body or the car. And I didn't know enough then to realize it was so much more complicated. Well, thanks to the Institute of Noetic Science, we now have research that actually proves what we've been working on as a principle for so many years, especially in, in alternative and complementary medicine. One of the questions that I kept asking for years was, why doesn't anybody do research on people who have spontaneous remissions? Why is all that research money spent on creating new drugs? Why are they looking at sick people? Why don't they look at people who actually manage to heal it and find out how did they do that? How did they do that? Well, the Institute of Noetic Science did just that. And they looked at all kinds of things, but the bit that caught my eye was the mental emotional side of what changes these people made in order to completely heal cancer. Ions studied 1,574 clients who had cancer. And they reviewed everything they did that helped them have a spontaneous remission. Now, what really excited me, I hope you can read this. I'll, I'll read it to you because I'm afraid the type's a bit pale. Um, what I was excited about when I saw this list was it was everything that I had done to heal my tumor. And I went, wow. Now, I didn't necessarily do it in this order but I realized I had covered all these bases. So the first one is face the crisis. Now lots of people when they're first given a diagnosis, that's more stressful than having the illness, isn't it? You know, people were fine. Sometimes you don't even know you have cancer and then somebody gives you the diagnosis of you've got cancer, or you've got MS, you've got some dreadful disease and you go into a state of shock. Now how are you going to deal with that? Now, lots of people deal with it very, very well. Some people don't. Some people flip out. Some people get very panic-stricken. So being able to face the crisis is a place that NLP can help a great deal, and, and so can NES, and maybe now with the eye health as well. Finding new meaning. For me, this means purpose. And one of the things that I've noticed about all the people I've met personally who've healed dramatically is they give their whole life a new meaning or a new purpose. Somehow their illness becomes a stepping stone. They move beyond it to a whole new phase, or they use it in some way, or it transforms them, or they have such deep, meaningful insights that they grow from it. So I do everything I can to help people interpret their experience of having an illness away from, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me, to, hey, I must have created this for some reason. What could that be? What could that be? Now, that means taking responsibility, of course. And most of the general public is not encouraged to think about their health or their illnesses in terms of being responsible for them. Most people think their bodies are like cars, that they should run perfectly. And when they don't run perfectly, you take it into a mechanic to be fixed. Now, there's still a danger that people could look at an NES practitioner in the same way. So we, we need to go back to helping people understand that they need to take that responsibility and say, this is my body, whatever has happened, has something to do with me. <laughs> Whatever's going on in here, I've done this. So the good news about that is if I've created it, I can uncreate it. Number three is learning to express your emotions. Now, a lot of people are um, quite shy at expressing emotions. 
until they get so big they explode. And other people are very, very reluctant to feel emotions or express emotions because they think that's what expressing emotions is. But there's a big difference between feeling an emotion and, and authentically expressing how you feel and spewing it all over everybody else, what I call having a tantrum. Big difference. So learning how to express your emotions was definitely something that NLP could help with. So I was very excited about this. Step four was creating a healing support team. Now, a healing support team could be your medics, your NES practitioner, could be your family, could be friends, could be spiritual people in your community. It could be anybody who you consider to be part of your healing support team. Sometimes you, yourself, need to be part of your healing support team. And maybe that's number one member of the team. Five is to work in partnership with medics. Now, I came from a background of a family that didn't really like orthodox medicine. You know, we were way ahead of our time in, you know, health foods, all kinds of natural remedies. You know, we were, never went to the doctor, didn't have vaccinations. None of that stuff was, was the, the way that my family operated. So I had a great reluctance to have to deal with doctors, but I realized quite quickly that if I didn't deal well with my doctors, I wouldn't get very good treatments. And I got very lucky, uh, very lucky indeed. I met some doctors that weren't terribly helpful. They were very scientifically minded and straight to the book. But the, the endocrinologist that I worked with for 10 years was absolutely charming. He was a wonderful man with a big heart and a great twinkle in his eyes. And I actually miss him because he became such an important part of my support team that I've gotten through it without him just monitoring my progress once a year. I only saw him once a year for the last you know, eight years. But he was important because he could verify it, and he was there as my safety net. Now, a support team member doesn't have to be there every day.